Good morning, everyone. I, I know off here on the left, um, <clears throat> I've been uh, having my image floating around um, while I fiddle with a few things just to make sure that we are actually recording. And uh, I want to thank uh, Michael for giving me a hand here with all of these matters because it gets a little bit complex. So apparently <clears throat> this is number 13 of our series four, Identify as Being. And I've been trying to work on some um, techniques that, you know, maybe people can practice and which will be um, useful. Um, the subject in a way is so simple that it, it escapes you. <coughs> Excuse me. Or escapes us. You know, just suddenly just slips away because it's so obvious in a sense. But just because something is simple doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. So <laughs> somehow I've been trying to uh, work on making it a little bit easier. We have um, kind of a book in progress. And as you know, um, if you're signed up uh, with the uh, Identify as Being group on the uh, yahoogroups.com. I've been sending out a little bit of a, a seed thought every day, or a seed of the infinite, or dropping a seed, you know, that's the idea. I've just I've done a few of these, and I'm going to just review them without much discussion, but if you want something to think about for five or 10 minutes a day, uh, maybe these uh, seeds will be useful. And if everything works out as I hope it will, there will be kind of a change in perspective uh, about what we're doing here, you know, what what life is and uh, what is the nature of our apparently being here uh, on earth. It's, it'll be, it'll be a different point of view, you know, that's, that's the idea. A different point of view that maybe we could pass our, our whole life and we would never come to this point of view. Of course, according to your ray, let's say the ray of your soul and uh, even more essentially, the ray of your monad, you will have um, different methods of approaching what you consider to be real. And I, you know, I can't, I don't want to change your approach. I just want to offer you the chance perhaps of using this particular method in a way that might reveal something new. Uh, I know it's pretty early in the United States and uh, and, and also in South America and uh, in Australia and New Zealand more possible and here in Europe more possible. I just want to, um, <clears throat> morning voice, sorry, just to say hi to those of you who are here. Um, of course, Michael and Tuya are here and Anne Veronica, hi, and Annette and Brennan. Um, Catherine and Jeff. 
and Joan and Karen and Martin and Miro, Risto, Raz and uh, Tia. So far, you have overcome some, uh, you know, early early morning, late night obstacles. Some of you and. Uh, I'm very grateful for your presence. Now, what I thought I would do is in a meditative way, uh, read a few of these um, seeds which I have dropped. And you know, I've, I've got a lot of them, so I've got to choose which ones might be useful to you. Uh, and then we'll we'll end um, with uh, proposing a technique. Actually, yesterday I was pondering. Well, I couldn't almost help it. You know, I I was just kind of forced interiorly to ponder on a few things, and I came up with two things. One is called. Uh, an OTO, O-T-O, you know, just make it easy to remember. And I'll get to that today, I hope. Uh, I call it, you know, don't, don't be afraid of this big word, uh, on, ontology. <laughs> it's sort of the study of being, you know. So I call it a, an ontological takeover, O-T-O. And I think the next one, I came up with an OP, uh, op, up, whatever, and I found it very interesting. I don't know if I'll get to it today. Maybe not. It's a technique. These are techniques. And an up is what I would call, uh, you know, how when things oscillate, they go back and forth. So I'm, I'm calling it, um, oscillatory perspective, OP. And basically what it means, <clears throat> and we will get there, is that one moment I see with my eyes and the next moment I see with my heart. Two ways of seeing. <clears throat> and when we were, you know, in the arcane school a long time ago, um, Alice Bailey had some lesson sets, and one set was last about six months. She called it uh, the doctrine of the eye. You know, and there are generally two of them, <laughs> unless, of course, you're seeing with the single eye. And the other lesson set was the doctrine of the heart. I heart, I heart, I heart, back and forth. I'll try to illustrate the difference between them and suggest that this OP technique might be a great way to <clears throat> practice between two different modes of perception. But as I say, I, I just want to kind of say this is coming, but um, not immediately. <laughs> so to begin with, in kind of a meditative way and re realizing, look, you know, we do a lot of study of Master DK as Master DK. What he writes, exactly what he writes, with meticulous entirety, point for point, relationship for relationship. The great majority of our programs, that majority is uh, just what Master DK wrote and we try to understand it. Th this is the one, at least from my perspective, 
the one uh, deviating program. <clears throat> it's it's not so much what um, Master DK has written, but of course, his hints are everywhere to be found if we know a little bit about what is this um, science of being or this science of non relations. With most of what we study from DK, it's a wonderful science of relations. And with this one kind of program that we do, um, it's not. It's something very, very different. So it may not be to everybody's taste, or you may find that you can get something out of it. And basically, uh, let me read uh, Seeds 1, 2, and 3. Just get yourself in a meditative mood. <clears throat> Med meditative orientation. And let it kind of sink in and maybe some kind of hint or realization will come. So this is um, seed number one. And I'm going to try to keep going with these, you know, even if it's just one sentence or one word. I'll, I'll try on a daily basis when I can unless I'm traveling and uh, have no access to internet, I'll try to make a little seed and I'll send it to you. Okay, so this is seed number one. True understanding is identification. It is really pervasive intra-standing, intra-meaning within. Thus, I, I sometimes draw it like a figure eight, thus I can understand, intra-stand, the farthest or most interior reaches of universal logoic self-perception. This does not necessarily mean, you know, for a human being, not for a long time, this does not necessarily mean I know all about those farthest reaches, but I can never be eliminated from them. Now the eye there is, um, it's not the little egotistical eye. It's a much deeper, um, in the universe kind of I. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I just have. So this kind of understanding, interstanding, does not mean I know all about the things that I am understanding and interstanding, but you can't get rid of me because I am the very essence of this perception that I un that I stand under and am within. Okay. Now Seed number two. No, 
okay and I better uh, see if I can find seed number two. I think this would be it. And likely you can let me know if I miss out on that. <clears throat> seed number two. There is no real time. Emphasis on the word real. There are no real intervals between apparent times. Time is maha mayavik, only occurring, um, usually only occurring within universe. Time is maha mayavik, the illusion of time is the product of bounded, emanatively divided, universal, logoic self-perception. And I'm going to add one word, limited. The illusion of time is the product of bounded, limited, emanatively divided, this emanation is different from that emanation, etc. Universal logoic self-perception. If the great logos of the universe did not see itself, there would be no um, no, none of these perceptions, these little perceptions. There is no <clears throat> real space. There are no real intervals between apparent spaces. Space is Mahamayavik meaning, you know, occurring only in a universe. The illusion of space is the product of bounded, limited, emanatively divided, universal logoic self-perception. meaning <clears throat> the Logos, our, our great universal Logos, by an act of will, wills to see less and less of itself. And its lessening perceptions create the many, many things in a universe. Remove all universal logos, logo, excuse me, re remove all universal logoic finite self perceptions, that is bounded, um, limited self perceptions from the most encompassing to the smallest, and thus you will remove time and space. Now that's going to take some pondering, but um, y you know, even the the conventional great philosophers have said something about this. Uh, uh, Immanuel Kant maybe was the main one, and uh, he said that time and space are categories of mind. 
they're not real, they are ways of perceiving. As to what is reality, that's another matter. Okay, so that's seed number two. Seed number three. And again, if I can find um, Yeah, I'm hoping that's seed number three. Let identification as, not with, but as, let identification as in universe substantiality, meaning you're underneath it all, let identification as in universe substantiality rescue you from form and its boundness, boundedness, except for the universal boundary. It takes something else to be rescued from that. So I'll repeat it. Let identification as in universe substantiality rescue you from form and its boundedness. But you can't be rescued yet from the universal boundary. In universe, such a rescue is necessary at a certain point of development, you know. Supra-universally, which is beyond all mahamayavic intra-self arisings, that means everything around you, no rescue is ever necessary. If there is no universe and you are in your super universal state, no rescue is necessary. Then uh, substantiality, you know, being the very essence of things, substantiality prevails alone and forever. And thou art that. Taking it from the old, um, old saying from the Upanishads, thou art that. So is it legitimate to speak of a super or supra universal state? And I would say, yes, it is, because the universe is just a self-perception. And if that self-perception, that a universe is a limited self-perception, and if that limited self-perception stops, which it periodically does, you are above and beyond any universe. Now it'll take some getting used to these ideas, if you want to. The last one that I'm going to deal with is called uh, number four. And uh, I'm hoping this is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay, this is, uh, this is the one we're going to meditatively look at today. In some ways, it's really easy. What we're trying to do is to become what we see. All around us, we detect, we see, we register, we hear, we, you know, we, we sense things are going on, things are happening. And what we're trying to do is to expand our sense of identity 
so that we become all these happenings equally. I don't care what it is. If it's happening, you're it. If it's happening, you are it, essentially. Not in terms of maha mayavic form. Look, maha is, means great, and maya is illusion. So maha mayavic means within the great illusion of the universe. It seems very real, but it's not real in the ultimate sense. It is um, actual, and you have to deal with it forever, cyclically, forever, and have been doing that. But Mahamaya means the universe, any universe, and its content. And if we listen to HPB, <laughs> there have been universes without end and without beginning. Ours is not the last. Uh, any universe that has ever been is not the last, obviously, nor is it the first. Any universe that ever was, even a million universes ago, let's say, uh, is preceded by an infinitude of universes which happened earlier in the illusion we call time. So what it means is you're going to be a lot around for a long time and you always have been, <clears throat> but it's not the you that we normally say this, this, this is I, you know, this human being, this, you know, member of the animal kingdom, animal human kingdom on the planet, that, that's not the one that's around forever. The, the real I is what we're looking for, a different thing altogether. Now, yesterday I got into this thing about an Oto, almost sounds like one of those cash machines at a, <laughs> at a supermarket. We, we have that here in Finland, you know, and maybe it's called Otto, I don't know. But um, an Otto just is kind of like a little code, you know, so I think of it faster, means an ontological takeover. Well, think about Wall Street, you know, there are these uh, friendly takeovers of one company by another. And then there are these uh, hostile takeovers. You know, you're, you're gaining control over something. That's what a takeover is. So what's an Oto? Because in a way, for a few minutes every day, you want to be able to have an Oto, <laughs> meaning Simply, you want to be able to sense the beingness of things rather than their quality. I can look at this computer screen with a lot of different parts and pieces of it, a lot of little symbols and diagrams, a lot of letters, you know, a lot of little things. But that's the quality of it. That's not the essence of it. So an Oto is helping you get to the essence of anything. And that's quite a trip, you know, to get to the essence of anything that you perceive whatsoever. And you find out that that, um, you find out that that essence is the same everywhere. 
and that it's really you. Now that that's quite a leap, you know, to to think that way because a lot of us are in that stage where we say, well, I am different from you and you are different from I and here's how we are different so that I will always be I and you will always be you and never the two will uh, be the same. And I'm working in exactly the opposite direction. Which um, means that the real you is immortal, immutable, ineradicable, can't wipe it out, inextinguishable, can't put out the flame you are. That's, you know, we're looking for the real you. And when Yogananda had uh, his uh, different centers, you know, in California and maybe elsewhere, they were called a uh, self-realization fellowship. Beautiful idea. And that, and that self was everywhere the same. Now, we're used to thinking that no two selves are the same and that everything is different from everything else. Now, that is true in Mahamaya, in the Great Illusion. Everything, everything is... Uh, at least slightly different than everything else, but not in reality. And that's what we're looking for in this one program that is different from um, our usual theosophical studies. Okay, so now I'll read some of this and we get into a uh, <clears throat> meditative state of mind. And, you know, maybe revelation comes, maybe realization comes, maybe at night, in the night of our consciousness, a bolt of lightning appears in the sky and lights everything up for a split second. And then more and more the lightning at night will last until everything is illuminated. Okay, with an Oto. In universe, it is an ontological takeover, a taking over of the being of another. only to discover that that being is one's own being. You know, people say, hey, who do you think you are? Well, to put it simply, I am you <laughs> and you are I. Okay, the taking over of a being of another, the essence, only to discover that that being is one's own being. And I, I can put it this way, in being, there are no differences. Now, as I say, it's not how we usually think. But for a few minutes a day, I don't think it hurts to think this way. Now, in terms of you and me, what we used to call you and you and I, you and me, an Oto is an act of infuception. Remember, infuception and perception. Infuception, you infuse the thing you perceive. 
And Otto is an act of infuception, revealing my being of you and your being of me. If we are self-conscious, at least, you got to be self-conscious before you can do any of this. An Otto is an act of infuception or um, let's call it infuception pervasion. You know, pervade, it goes everywhere. <clears throat> An Otto is an act of infuception pervasion revealing my being of you and your being of me. Now I've got a couple of generalities here. I don't know if they're valuable, I'll just read them. It, I've tried to generalize a little bit here. In terms of any self-conscious being that I'm calling X, and then any self-conscious or not self-conscious being, which I'm calling Y, an auto, it, an auto, is an act of infuception revealing X's being of Y. Sounds like algebra, you know. So if you hated algebra, you might not like this. <laughs> X, X is always Y. In normal thinking, X is never Y. X is X and Y is Y. But when you can pervade or get inside something or go beyond the apparent ring pass knot, then X becomes Y. The revelation is of X's being of Y. Now we can look at it from the other side and we'll say if Y is the self-conscious being and X is either conscious, self-conscious or not self-conscious, it is an act of infuception revealing Y's being of X. It goes back and forth. If X is self-conscious, X knows that Y is the same as X. If Y is self-conscious, it knows that X is the same uh, as Y. So if you're se if you know, it's a deliberate act, you, you know, but you're basically facing everything around you and you're trying to see it in a certain way. So these autos, they're not possible unless the one who's taking over is self-conscious. If I'm a starfish or at this time, or a, a worm, or, you know, even a whatever, <laughs> whatever animal or a plant, or whatever. I can't do an oto, but I can be the object of an oto. In other words, when someone with self-consciousness looks on me, they find that I am what they are, even though I cannot, because I'm a plant or an animal, whatever, I cannot look back at them and find that they are what I am. I've got to be self-conscious. Then I threw in um, and we'll elaborate on it later. In the universe, I use the term in universe, being in universe is perfect presence. There are certain equivalent terms. Being, isness, presence, maybe a few more. They just mean there you are and you're the same as everything else. Um, while self-consciousness is not everywhere in universe, 
the word is ubiquitous, but let's just call it everywhere. While self-consciousness is not, because of all these emanations, found everywhere in universe, um, perfect presence, which is detectable most perfectly by the universal logos is everywhere in universe. Everything is present, but not necessarily aware of everything else. Maybe a little work needs to be done on this point G. If it is, it's present. And presence is really all there is. So sometimes we speak about, oh, the presence of God. We're dealing with detecting presence. And presence is the raw fact of being. I know these are a lot of abstractions, but once we get get hold of it and say, ah, oh, that's what that's what is meant here. Then it's more than words. Every perception is a self perception, and uh, every perception is a revelation of presence. And there's only one presence in a universe, only one, and that is the presence of a universal logos. So I'm concluding by saying, practice otos, practice ontological takeovers, in universe as if, whoop, sorry, as if they were the equivalence between, and now I'll make some equivalences, perfect presence in universe, universal isness, universal I-ness. Those, those things are all equivalent. Presence in the universe, isness in the universe, I-ness in the universe, those things are all the same. So, let me put it this way. If, if a thing is it is I. If the thing is, it's I. Now, if, if you're successful having an auto, uh, if you're successful having an ontological takeover, you're going to know that. And maybe the hardest thing, you know, I find it the hardest thing is to transfer isness to inus. Uh, and I'll just put that down, if you don't mind, for me. The hardest thing is to transfer isness into I-ness, or this is how I often write it. Okay, so if you are successful in your practice, because it all takes practice, your isness. 
will have eventually transcended, eventually, big, big, that's a big word because, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, will have eventually transcended all rings pass not in universe except the universal ring pass not, the boundary of the universe. And even that ring pass not will be transcended at this universe's universal Maha Pralaya. When Pralaya comes and the universe dissolves again and yet again, you will have transcended the boundary of the universe. So is there anything beyond the universe? And I say there is. Beyond that universal logoic self-perception called the universe, you know, at, at the end of every universe, there is but one perceiver remaining. And that perceiver is a self-perceiver. The only thing it can see is itself. And that self-perceiver is the absolute deity in whom um, otos or uh, ontological takeovers um, are sorry, automatic, built in, effortless. Beyond the universe, you don't have to work at producing an auto because you just know you are everything. And, and, and who's the you that's knowing all that? It's the uh, absolute, uh, absolutely infinite God. That's who knows. So then I end with the uh, peculiar statement, practice otos. Now, someone wrote to me, one of our friends wrote to me, and said, how do you practice an oto? And I wrote back this. This is how you do it. And now I'm gonna try to Make that visible for you, how to achieve an auto. One imaginatively pervades every object of perception. You, you always got to use your imagination. One imaginatively pervades every object of perception. By imagining one's true uh, within the universe self, inter-universal self, as all-pervading and all-pervading intangible presence. So that's um, first, imagination is the key. The old mystics used to say, break the twig and I am there. It's a profound idea, actually. One imaginatively becomes the substance or substantiality of all perceptual arisings. If something comes up and you think it's a thing, thing, you are it. One attempts to realize that all arisings arise from that intangible presence, which is my identity as isness. Now this one is, uh, this one, this is tough to imagine, but okay, we try. One opens the heart 
or hearts. You know, we have a number of hearts. We got between the shoulder blades and top of the head and the causal body and the monad. They're all they're all hearts. One opens the hearts and finds the beingness of another, realizing that that beingness is I. You know, number eight, that's how I write it often. You find the beingness of another, not, not every little part and piece about the other, but the beingness of another. You try to find that, and you realize that when you found it, it is yourself. And then one takes over the true identity of another, realizing that that true identity has always been one's own identity, one's own isness. Many other ways of describing this imaginative process. Many, many ways. One plunges imaginatively into the sea of sameness. Remember, if you've read the big poem, The Light of Asia, the dewdrop slips into the shining sea. A well-known theosophical poet, Sir Edwin Arnold, one plunges imaginatively into the sea of sameness. These are all techniques, imaginative techniques for practicing an oto. Um, simply, simply put, either actually or imaginatively perceive and be the perception. Perceive and be the perception by finding, somehow, the substantiality in common between you as the perceiver and that which you perceive. There's some kind of essence here, which is the real you and the real, the real whomever, and realize it's the same essence, it's in common. If you have being and I have being, that being is the same. Our real identity. Now these are some hints of what it means to practice ontological takeovers or otos. And then uh, I just responded. There is a kind of incomparable spiritual intimacy in that beingness. It's more than it's more than saying, you know, well, I love you, which is really important, but I be you. That's another step. And I kind of joke here and I say, as for super universality, it's like climbing a mountain. I'm gonna throw my piton a little higher up the mountain and try to but I'm too weak to pull myself up and over the edge, you know. Not yet. Can't do it. But I can think about it. So that that those are could be systematized a little better or a lot better. But this is my advice to one of our friends about how to practice an auto. And the thing is, use your imagination all the time. Because as DK has told us, imagination becomes intuition. And basically, you have to intuit, you have to use your intuition to really uh, fulfill what an auto is. So that will be enough of this kind of description. And the next time, I'll try to offer a very precise technique called oscillatory perception, meaning going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between two things. And because you do that, each one of those things gets clearer. And I'll try to explain that.
Okay, friends. So that's it for the moment um, in terms of um, all we got to do now is just find an object in your imagination or in the room where you are or whatever. Often, often some, for some people it works better when you think of someone else or see someone else. But for some people they can look at an animal or a plant or a gem, you know, mineral, whatever, it'll still work for them. So isolate something in your mind And see if you can make it real by taking over its being, its beingness. Can you detect and become the beingness of the object that you are focusing on? Can you detect that beingness and consciously become that beingness of whatever you are focusing on, an image of a person, an actual person, and either an image or a, an actuality in front of you, either a human being or some other kingdom, can you find, can you take over the beingness, become the beingness of that um, object or state or condition? Let's have a little silence and we'll see if we succeed at all.
Well, okay, this is um, this is something that can be practiced, and it's just the beginning. Now, the next time we get together, and I hope someone will remind me because I tend to keep moving in these matters. Um, I want to give you a simple technique that I call oscillatory perception, OP, which will change your point of view back and forth regarding any object that you choose to visualize or focus upon. Meanwhile, I'll practice it so I know what I'm talking about. As I say, the, the, the whole question is so simple that it is difficult. It's all about registering the presence of anything and identifying as that presence or realizing that, you know, if it is, it's you. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but uh, finally, you know, that's what it comes down to. Practice autos, uh, if it is, it's Now, you can't live that way all the time. You, you, you have to, you know, deal with the doctrine of the I, E-Y-E, -E, and not just of the heart. You cannot, um, you have to handle things on their own level. At least, uh, you have to know how to do that because otherwise we will not succeed in just living the life on the physical plane, which we have to do. And we're always going to be limited, except when we're not. You know, every time there's a universe, that universal logos goes into a state of emanative limitation. Okay, so I'll put it down here. With the onset of every universe, the universal logos goes, well, enters a state of emanated. So the big world illusion is going to happen forever and has been happening forever and all it means is a number rather than no number. Blavatsky talks about that. When there is number, there is illusion. And when there is no number, there is no illusion. So we have to count forever, cyclically. And we have to return to zero also underneath it all. So there's one set of rules for living in the world of number and another approach for living in the world of no number. You know, we're, we're, we're a little bit beyond the fence here, you know, as they say, beyond the pale beyond the fence, following out the implications of non-duality. And uh, if we have the courage to persist with it, uh, there will be a kind of revelation that we could safely call the initiate consciousness. 
I mean, the masters have it, you know, and uh, they're trying to make masters of us so that we know what it is they see. And when we don't see it yet. Okay, I'm going to break now. And um, if there are any thoughts or questions, um, I'll ask uh, Michael to uh, let me let me know. And, and then, yeah. yes, there are a number of comments, questions so forth. So we begin with Kim writing, when I hear about infinity in this way, I then ask myself, what is the point of it all? I.e., why bother with anything? Yeah, I guess um, that's a good question. And uh, so you are perfect forever and complete forever. So why should there be a universe at all unless there's constant, constant self-improvement on and on, you know? Because we can get behind that idea of we're always improving, always getting better, always having more capacity. But it has to do, I think, with some kind of a, a joyful, blissful aestheticism. It has to do with a play, a drama, a dance, uh, a demonstration, you know, a work of art. Uh, it has to do with, uh, I guess I would call it universal play. We can only improve if we are limited. If we're not essentially limited, the beingness of us cannot improve. You can't improve on being. Being is an ultimate. It just is exactly what it is and without a cause. Uh, the, the way this was um, put in the, <laughs> it was interesting. It was in a treatise on cosmic fire and it was a um, kind of a channeling or a, uh, imparted message to Dr. Anna Kingsford, who was a friend of Blavatsky's and uh, she died young, but she was brilliant and uh, and somehow she had this inner connection with certain teachers who were trying to get something through. And she basically asked the question that you asked and um, they began by saying, um, or whatever was speaking through her, we had hoped to withhold this discussion from you at this time. So they began by saying, well, you know, we'd really rather not take it up. But they ended up with a statement that all of this exists so that God can be aught other than God. In other words, the idea that the dynamic of all oneness needs to be periodically broken so that God can have the illusion of becoming other than itself which is the drama, the play, the dance, whatever you want to call it, the creative project, the creative becoming. It seems to be a necessity within the one that having the company of multiplicity is uh, necessary. So the within a universe, you will absolutely improve, you will do your role, you will have the ever reawakening bliss of growing back into the wholeness of the great being, and always with some new method and some new partial discovery, 
only to discover that all of that that you are discovering was forever a part of absolute infinitude beyond any universe. Now, you know, we're, we're hardly in a position to be able to describe the realization, the bliss, the growth of a being in the universe, a high being. We're, we're not in that position. We, we just know that when something new comes along and it really explains a lot and you get an aha, there's an inherent bliss in it. There's an inherent joy in it. And I think that the whole creative process is about the experience of that bliss, that joy, that discovery, that, you know, thing. And that in terms of improving on our essence, that's impossible. Improving on our manifestation of the essence in universe is forever possible. See, what does one want to become anyway? The, the, the seeker and the sought are one. You're already there forever. And yet the old saying that if God is God, uh, that God must be able to create the stone he cannot lift. So there's something on the aesthetic dimension going on with all of these universes, on the joy dimension, on the bliss dimension, on the game dimension. It is the game of privation. Um, the, 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 the great one who is equipped with everything deprives itself as part of the process of that everythingness and works out a particular relationship, the result of which is a creative joy, creative bliss, or whatever. And of course, the farther we get along as we reincarnate and join with others, the, the less feeble our explanations will be. I realize I just gave, you know, kind of a, a feeble explanation, but it's the best I can do at the moment. And when we are more than man, and when we're more than a logos of a planet or a star or whatever, our explanations will become progressively more filled with the realization of what that bliss really is. So I think that's probably all I can say it's not about improving on being. It's in universe about the improving on the expression of being, but not on the being itself. And, and then when you say, well, what's the point? Then I say back to you, well, what do you want? See, then you have to examine your desire nature and see what it is what purpose is for you and what desire is for you, then maybe the question can be more easily answered. I think that's all I better say on that for the moment. And next we have Roz comment, commenting, knowing that we are part of everything is the great cure for the loneliness what many in the wor world feel. Knowing that we are part of everything is the great cure for the loneliness that meant, oh, she wrote it twice. Okay, why not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Roz, what I would like to say is something radical. Yes, we are part of everything and we are are the everything that we are part of. So obviously I'm, I've got two different identities going here, right? I've got my little emanative identity, which is any sort of particular thing that I become in universe, in universe, I, you, I just, you know, use that 
all the time. And we're the whole thing as well. Now that, that's where a lot of us say, whoa, what do you mean here? How can you be part and the whole at the same time? But in terms of mistaken identity, we are the part, and that's the Mahamaya, and that's where the creative game, play, dance, whatever, is played out among these parts. And the great science of relations is what must be mastered to know how to play your part, you know? Arcane school, I play my part with stern resolve, with earnest aspiration, you know, all that. How to play a part and still be the wholeness in which the part is being played. And both are true. And it's in the second of these assertions that people balk and they pull back and say, what do you mean I am the whole? I'm the part, how can I be the whole? Well, let us learn to reconcile the part and the whole, and let us learn to reconcile the many and the one. It's a specific philosophical exercise. How can we reconcile the many and the one and realize that the many are the one and the one uh, is the many? So we're both, basically. And next, Anne Veronica writes, could space and time be one of the greatest pair of opposites? Space creates time and time cannot exist without space. Space and time create the universe. Monad and form create the soul. The higher and the lower meet. All of this reminds me of having pervaded the universe with a part of me I stand. I can't remember it exactly. Having pervaded the entire universe with a fragment of myself, I remain. That's, that's, that's the saying and the solar angel can say it and any greater being can say it when they are attempting to infuse themselves into a lesser being and still not be totally present in that lesser being, lest the form of the lesser being explode or just be destroyed. So, the, uh, you know, I think you said a lot of good things there. The first thing, however, I want to deal with. Uh, and what was it? The space and time do what, Michael? What the what was the could, very first? Yeah. Could space and time be one of the greatest pairs of opposites? And then the next thing was? Space creates time and time cannot exist without space. Okay, space creates time. And time cannot exist without space. Okay, in terms of what creates time, You see, time and space are, are interrelated, as you say, and we sometimes even refer to this is all accomplished in a space of time. But what creates space and what creates time is limited self-perception, a psychological universe. There is no space unless the perceiver induces in itself a reduction of self-perception. Then limitation arises and division and multiplicity and space and time can exist. But space and time are not absolutes by any means. They are, they are created by self-reduced 
or reduced self-perception. At least that this is the way I'm tending to think uh, at this time. They don't just exist. They're not out there. They are the result of a type of self-observation of the great perceiver. And spaces and times arise because of in, impose limitations on those self-perceptions. I see more of myself, less of myself, less of myself, less of myself. Every time, well, what are you going to do with language? On every occasion <laughs> that I self-perceive a reduction of my wholeness, I have created a thing, an object, a variation, which, which, can, which must work out in the great science of relations. It's not the wholeness of me by any means, but it allows for sequence. Sequence does not exist in utter simultaneity. We little beings, we do not perceive with totally inclusive simultaneity, we perceive a sequence because we're limited. First this, then this, then this, then this. That gives the illusion of time. And as we move within our field of consciousness, from one reduced perception to another, it creates the illusion of space. To the simultaneous all perceiver who has not self divided itself, space and time will not be factors. They really won't exist. So we have to broaden our perceptions and, and get away from sequential perception that is based on our limitations. Usually if I'm looking around this room, I don't see everything at once. I see one thing after another. And, and that is the result of my limitation, the limitation of my perception. If my perception were not limited and I saw all things simultaneously and sensed the essence of all things as one thing, then time would disappear and space would disappear. And as a matter of fact, well, you can't even talk about it really, but in absoluteness, there is no time and space. There is no observer because an observer would be a second one. And what we're talking about is the causeless cause, which is indivisible forever. So all of those particularities, space, time, intelligence, love, will, blah, 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 in absoluteness do not exist. Only ultra, well, a Venus beyond any possibility of enhancement or reduction. That is what exists. But then again, I said I would stay out of the super universal world for a while because it's just, you know, it's just too much. And we'll just kind of work things out imaginatively in the universe. Because one day, forever, as it always has been, we are our, our, our selfness will be seen as 
that of the universal logos which we are. And then our job will be to transcend that finite ring pass knot that we have put upon ourselves to make a universe. But up to that time, we're just, you know, when I was a kid, I used to like to break thermometers. I don't think my parents appreciated this too much. I'd go to the dining room table, I'd take a thermometer, and I'd break it. And a bunch of little beads of mercury would be spread out in the area of maybe a foot or something, you know, circumference, six inches, whatever. A bunch of little beads of mercury. Of course, it's probably a dangerous thing but maybe we didn't know about that then, mercury poisoning. And then maybe if there would be 50 beads of mercury, I would push them. And when two little beads of mercury touched each other, they would go whoop, and they'd become one bead. And then finally, all the little pieces became one piece. The thermometer wasn't much good anymore, <laughs> but I kind of learned the lesson about the many and the one. And uh, it was amazing to me that those uh, little beads of mercury would coalesce immediately. Well, that, that's what our evolution is in any... Um, in any universal system. We, each one of us is like a bead of mercury. And when we, under certain conditions, we coalesce with other beads until a lot of group consciousness and group being comes the consciousness of the one and oneness being, however to put it. And finally, after all those little beads of mercury coalesce, we are the universal logos, which we started out to be before emanation took over, or before we started to see less and less of ourselves. That's all, to me, that's what emanation is. My will to see less and less of myself until multiplicity arises within the field the former field of oneness. And then coming back to have all those little parts and pieces coalesce once again. That's how I see it at the moment. Now, you know, we're just little human beings here at the moment, and we have a lot of limitations in our method of perception. And, you know, we're like, uh, if we, if we look at a, you know, look in the earth after rain and there's these night crawlers, these worms, you know, and we have our human intelligence and we see this, these worms crawling along and we say, well, what do they know? And there are beings who can look at us and say, what can a human being possibly know? And they would be right. But meanwhile, we have that spirit. We are that spirit. And that spirit demands a return to its realized fullness. And we're on our way, uh, yet again, forever, to the realized fullness of being the universal logos. And that's just the beginning. A universe has to disappear before we really come into ourselves. I know it. I know it's a big stretch, but um, this question of identity, there are so many uh, restraints upon understanding identity. You have to dare to let yourself go 
in the understanding of who you are and realize that we've been living a, a huge case of mistaken identity. And we have to correct that. Okay. Thank you. Roz added to her earlier uh, comment, or should I say, loneliness is the result of thinking we are divided. It's good. And um, this mistaken identity uh, where we are the partial self rather than the whole self is the whole root cause of loneliness. Now, even in a horoscope, you know, Saturn that divides one thing from another with that scythe, you know, Saturn rules isolation and loneliness. So, you know, you can almost tell when you're going to be thrown back on yourself and live through a lonely period by taking a look and seeing what Saturn is, is doing in your chart. And then we have that thought, I, little I, am alone. I'm unrelated. I'm excommunicated, you know. <laughs> but if we go deeper, we will see that division is an illusion in the Mahamaya. And we have to overcome that sense of division, that thought that we are divided one from another. And we overcome that by an experience of being the other. And that's what I call an OTO, you know, ontological takeover, that experience of being another or whatever. If, if there is a perception, I'm it. I, can, I cannot perceive anything that I am not, good or bad. If I look at the most awful thing in the world, I'm still it. Qualitatively, I throw quality out the window for a while. I come back to it and think qualitatively all the time when studying Master DK, but for a little bit, get rid of quality and just look at the isness of anything, good or bad. So it really is beyond good and evil in, you know, in the philosophical sense that was it Nietzsche that was writing about that. Maybe he meant something quite different, but it is beyond good and evil. Isness is beyond good and evil. And my thinking, like you say, that I'm separate is a cause of much uh, emotional misery. We have to get back to being whatever we perceive and then handle it qualitatively according to the rules, you know, but uh, at least start with being whatever you perceive. How do you get there? Well, that takes practice and I'm not there and I'm working on it. But, you know, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I don't see and I still hope, but something from what you will see and what you do hope for is already with you when you have faith. Okay. Next we have Ann Veronica writing, in making a logic diagram for computer programming, X equals X plus one. It doesn't stand as a mathematical equation, but it means identify uh, that they are the same or equal. X plus one takes the place of X and it doesn't stop unless you give it a number to stop. Let's say a maxa myavic eon. And what you call maxa maxi myavic? Uh, she wrote Maxa Mayavik Eon. 
okay, you know, because basically you're dealing with essence here and not with number. You're in the you're in the realm of of essence, you know. And I guess here's the thing: you you cannot really add or subtract, add to or subtract from absolute infinitude. So it could be x as absolute infinitude equals absolute infinitude plus absolute infinitude. You, you basically have an absoluteness which is not vulnerable to enumeration. Enumeration does not change infinitude. So, you know, you're the mathematician here and, you know, you have this, I think, pretty strong fifth ray somewhere in here, fifth ray, third ray, and you will work it out uh, according to your best light through the door that is open to you to uh, um, the key that you must use to open the door upon the uh, ageless wisdom or the secret doctrine. There are all these different keys and they're not all suitable to everybody, but I can begin to sense what what may be an important key to turn the lock for you. So yes, it, it uh, we have to get beyond number into the realm where number makes no difference in the realm of uh, of absolute zero or the no number. It's sometimes difficult, you know, they say in computer language, it's all zeros and ones, but it, it's kind of difficult to um, discriminate between the zero and the one and realize, you know, is, is there a difference? Do they both exist? And can the zero be not nothing, but a no thing in which all division and form cannot exist. Then when we try to add number to it, it doesn't work because basically number demands division. And this is the only substance which is indivisible ever in any way. There is no, there is no thing else, nothing else. And this, whatever it is, which shouldn't even be approached with language, cannot, is not subject to enumeration. The absoluteness is not subject to enumeration. And maybe that makes of it the absolute zero you know, keep, keeping that away from the way we use uh, temperature control, absolute zero and so forth. Not that. So, okay, you, this is more the mathematical approach and uh, I think you're on to something there. And Anne Veronica has given another comment. The universe is a big Babbitt's atom which for me is a white hole. It seems that to come into being in this universe, you lose the higher dimensions spirale and getting out of the universe, you become a black hole, a perfect Babbitt's atom with all the spirale expressing themselves perfectly. At that moment of time, it crashes within and expresses itself in an other dimension. The beginning and the end always exist in time and are equal. Okay, this is um, interestingly said and I, I do think um, for every black hole uh, process, we do need the other side, the white hole, um, where we uh, have a, a more um, complete 
uh, well, let's say, a portion of infinitude has to enter through the white hole and will disappear through the black. So that basic, basic dynamic, I think, is uh, with us. Now, this would be a thing. Uh, Michael, can you make appear what Anne Veronica has just said, or is this the chat? Maybe I can make it appear. Uh, Big Babbitt's Adam. Okay, and of course, you know, Babbitt's Adam is the etheric atom of the uh, first of the atomic subplane. We have to, there's a simplification of atoms as we uh, ascend. So Babbitt's atom, it has these torrents coming in, coming out. It seems that to come into being in this universe, what comes into being, a portion of absolute infinitude comes into being, you lose your higher dimensions, you lose everything else in absolute infinitude except what is chosen or finitized by the uh, super universal God, self-observing. So, you know, you, you cannot bring absolute infinitude through a white hole. It has to be a chosen, finitized portion. And that's why I say that the, any universe is a finitude. But, I, but in terms of coming in and getting out, I do believe it is correct. And when you say that uh, the a perfect Bab uh, Babbitt's atom is then recreated, uh, basically how, what I see to be recreated is the rejoining of the universal process with absolute infinitude in a totally articulated manner. There is a difference between absoluteness, which is indivisible, and absolute infinity, which is infinitely divisible, at least in potential. So there is a return of universal content uh, into that absolute infinitude. And a denial of a, any kind of separated finitude we call a universe. All this reminds me of having pervaded, yeah, the universe with a fragment of myself. I remain. And what is an XPL? What is that? Let's see. Am I looking at it correctly? Let's see. And am I too far from it? All, all, not AL, XPL. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, yeah. So the white hole, black hole idea is there. And on the other side of the ultimate universal black hole. Now, we have, I think, many black holes as planes change uh, towards simplification. But there is an ultimate black hole which returns universal content to absolute infinitude or at least does not allow a separation, a finite separation of that content in a universe. It annihilates a universe and we have a condition then of absolute, absolutely articulated infinitude. Okay, well, I can see that, um, I, I guess I've tried to answer the best I can at, at the moment. Uh, there are some things that have to be gone into, but I, I do want to insist upon a certain point of view where space and time are not absolutes 
and they do not, in my view, create the universe. They are artifacts of self-observation, space and time. Artifacts of limited, sequentialized self-observation by the universe of Logos. Okay, anything else? The, perhaps the last uh, comment from Roz responding to uh, things that you have said, living that way would surely help us to live in this world with more understanding and joy. You know, Roz, um, some people get really depressed <laughs> when they think in these terms, you know, like, uh, this question, I think that Kim asked, and it, it's a universal question, well, what's the point of it all, you know? If on some level, perfection already exists, and we are that perfection. And I, I remember, I, I, I want to say, I had a friend. Our friendship never never went anywhere or deteriorated after I submitted these ideas. The person was so identified with being the improving part that when I suggested the reasons that essentially the real you is already it, it's already there, the person felt they were being robbed of their selfhood, their improving selfhood. So we have to have, in a way, a dual kind of consciousness that we are a tiny improving self in the Mahamayavic universe. And as well, we are the absolute perfection that forever exists to which nothing can be added, from which nothing can be subtracted, in which enumeration has no place at all. I'm talking about absoluteness now. And that's just such an abstract idea that it makes people recoil. So it takes a certain amount of um, courage, almost, uh, to think in, in, in these terms, a certain amount of, uh, yeah, I just have to say courage, because in a way, you're losing the self you thought you were. And, you know, people get very anxious about that. Well, then, who am I? What am I? What's the point? You know what I mean? We get really disoriented here. But sometimes it's necessary to destroy old thought forms so that something truer, more true, can inhabit consciousness. And in a way, that's what we're doing. Now, most of us, we're going to go around being a human being, and we should be, because that's, you know, in the great emanated Mahamaya, that's what we are, a human being. But simultaneously with that, we have to carry another identity. And that identity can be very frightening to quite a few people. So you just have to ask yourself, are you the type of individual who can carry, be the larger identity without fear? Or when you think of that particular ultimate expansion of your identity, do you, the little being, become afraid? 
Now, we know what's desirable in that case. We don't want to be afraid, <laughs> and we want to uh, be what we see. We want to identify as everything, which doesn't mean that in the rules of time and space, we have to approve of everything. I mean, some things are good, some things are bad. So we keep that, that going, that assessment. But at the same time, on a deeper level, there is something beyond good and evil, which I think if we can get it, as it were, it will, as you say, help us live in this world with more understanding and joy. And yeah. And there's that one more thing, right, Michael, that Anne Veronica has said. I am the mother and the child. I God, I matter am. We just turned into uh, the Virgo full moon. I think we had a very beautiful service with Tuya there. And um, we are all those things. Um, all of them. And, it, well, yeah, I mean, all of them and none of them, you know. A paradox, we have to learn how to, Master Mori is always talking about containing something. You've got to contain that, contain that. And we have to learn how to contain paradox. Okay, well, I hope I didn't drive anybody away permanently. <laughs> and um, that's it, Michael, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, okay. Well, I do want to thank you uh, for being here. Now, you know, we'll, we'll always close with something down to earth, which is the great invocation. <laughs> um, but I must admit, you know, that when we deal with these things, we're not exactly down to earth. Um, we're dealing with a, a whole different mode of perception where um, some, some people would call it solipsism, solipsism. And it's usually considered some kind of, uh, well, not exactly a mental disease, but you know, not so allowable in philosophy, but an enlightened solipsism I think comes much closer to the truth than subject, object, subject, object. You know, the Cartesian split that I am the observer and that is the observed and that's that. There's no identity between them. The observed is ever different from the observer. But with the right way of approaching solipsism, you realize and you practice it that there is nothing perceived which is not the real you. And that is the essence. And that essence is isness. And to, to, to detect the subtlety of isness and keep your mind from going right into the quality of it's good, it's bad, it's high, it's low, it's this color, that color, this sound, this, to, to, to keep your mind out of quality is a huge discipline. And I want to just say, and I'll bring it up next time, that only with the heart one can do it. Because the heart is the organ of synthesis. And what we're really doing here is we are approaching uh, in realization the synthesis that is. Synthesis is and unity has to be created. We are told by Master D.K. So instead of just throwing the word synthesis around, 
the way we tend to do, we may actually begin to learn what it is experientially, imperientially. And if things are not clear now, they will be clearer later in the sequence of illusory time. So just trust, you know, that you're using what 10% of your brain capacity or, you know, your, your brain cells are mostly unawakened, all of us, and they will start to pop and to awaken, as it were. And then the veils will lift and a whole new world of uh, that which arises from essence will present itself. And then we will be approaching, you know, we don't want to say anything more than that. We will be approaching initiate consciousness which you, you really can't define it in the normal terms and say it's more and more of what we're used to. It's something that we're not accustomed to. We're not used to it. But it's worth pursuing again. And as someone just said, it makes for greater joy and understanding in living uh, if, we, if we get it correctly and, and do it right. Because then you, you become the very subject and object simultaneously of all universal process. The real you. Thou art that. So, every once in a while, once a week or however, and for a little while, we can practice this alternative science of non-relations, the science of non-relations, as opposed to what we ordinarily study in theosophy and must study with meticulous entirety, the science of relations. Okay, friends, thank you, and let's do the great invocation together. <laughs> From the point of Michael. light, ah, 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 the voice of God. <laughs> You know, I could assume that everybody knows this, except that I myself have left out verses at times. There we go. Now all I have is, I'm so well trained, Michael, that I just have to hear my name and I know what's wrong. Okay, here we go. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. 
let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Tonight, friends, um, Reappearance of the Christ broadcast meditation at uh, 5 uh, p.m. GMT. And on we go, which is unusual for those who are already there forever. I'll uh, turn off the recording and Michael can... Uh, Dismiss us. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>